Hey everybody, welcome back to the walk on Tour United. I'm here with Mr. Nathan Bishop Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday I had along with what, 150 other people? I think it was 200. Was it 200? 200, never 200 people. I had the great privilege of hearing your testimony. Uh, I had the which, great honor of living it. <laughs> which I I know blessed me and everybody else. Because um, I've known you for a little while. Three years, I think. Yep. Something like that now. And uh, I've never heard your testimony until yesterday. That's kind of wild how, how that it happened because Tony tells me like in the last six weeks, hey, you need to give your testimony. And I was like, give my testimony, you know. So the first talk of it, it was funny, testimonies came up just before Sukkot, and I kept getting coached on how to tell my testimony, and I was just like, hey, Really? Yeah, like, well, you, you're going too long here. T Tony says this thing. He says, I make a long story longer. And that's because I force him to listen to me, and that's the only reason I do that. It's something that's, you know, he's he's lucky that way. But anyway, so my concern was, is you hear all this coaching about when you get on stage or when you have things to relay and don't go too far into this or you go too far because we've all sat in teachings and we've all been in places where you're like, man, I wish the guy would stop beating the dead horse. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so my, my that was really a concern of mine, and I've never uh, – never spoke or even I lived it and I knew how to live on account of it and I, I've never shared it but it's the only thing that I own well dude my you, story. you knocked it out of the park yesterday well, well, I mean that was for, 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 for you never to have shared that before that was that was, that was one that was a rock and two that was just it was just it was incredible yeah so, I've tried to get you to do this before. Yeah, it's been six months now. <laughs> and two buckets so, of bubble gum. Anybody that has been watching uh, The Walk for a little bit now knows that I did some uh, interviews during Sukkot. Which uh, I alluded. <laughs> yes, he did. Quite a few times, actually. <laughs> um, but there was one thing that you told me. Actually, you told Dad. Yeah. <clears throat> you said, and I quote... If you bring me bubblegum, <laughs> I will do the interview. So, Dad, can you can you grab that for me? So, I brought you bubblegum during Sukkot. And I never showed up. <laughs> and you never showed up. So, I ate the bubblegum. <laughs> and with this, I uh, I made sure that you got your bubblegum this time. Because here I am. <laughs> Lord have mercy, God. <laughs> is that real? <laughs> it is real. Pieces. So that's equivalent to three hundred dollars. If y'all know what I'm talking about, or three hundred haircuts, whichever one comes. Or three hundred interviews. Yeah, because this is <laughs> you see when we got haircuts, they gave us a piece of this bubble gum. So <laughs> I, I ain't opened it. No, no, no. Now the other one, I started marking. I started marking out. Uh, I would take a piece and I'd mark it out and write. 298 <laughs> <laughs> two, two, you know yeah. 290 that's what that big sharpie was for in my car really? yeah oh my God, that's big <laughs> so that's what that sharpie was for yeah. okay. uh, but yes there's your bubble gum I feel, i'm paid ahead you are paid ahead all right let's for, do this for quite some time yeah. uh so give us uh now my dog will have diabetes <laughs> like ours yeah, yeah just like yours <laughs> <laughs> diabetes <laughs> um so go ahead and uh let's uh get into what you were talking about yesterday that was uh it was deep yeah uh well what, what i remember is uh it started for me when i was 24 i was up in pennsylvania and i was working as i always did uh, I always worked up north or out west or in uh, the oil field pipeline. I run a, a, a pipeline from uh, Crystal Springs, Mississippi into Galveston Bay. Uh, that's in Texas. And then I've worked in Texas on drilling rigs. I've worked in the oil field in uh, Illinois. That 
I have worked in Pennsylvania on fracking the natural gas wells. That's the hardest part of the industry is fracking. Uh, so I was I always made money and I was always gone. I'd work six months a year and I'd uh, up north. I made forty three thousand dollars in six months. Wow, that's money that went in my pocket. Uh, and so I had no real sense of responsibility. You know, my my brothers. That was the only parent or only child between my mother and my father. They were each married previously before me, so I had siblings who were of previous marriages and stuff. So, uh, mom and dad were in their fifties when I was like five. So, the only influence I had was theirs, other than when my older siblings would just show up from time to time. And so, whatever junk they brought from the world, that was my influence. And then when I got old enough to go out on my own, they seemed to be there more often, so I would be into whatever they would be into. And so I started smoking with Jody, started drinking with Ronnie, and that led to other things and so on and so forth. And, and so the dominoes fall, you mm -hmm. know. So I've become very proficient in the way that I was raised. And so as I went in through my late teen years, we lost our home. I went into the world, started working, and so I never really uh, had any kind of a, a, a home, really, I, per se. So I, uh, I searched in all the wrong places. And so I reaped a, a bountiful harvest of what was terrible. I mean, it was just it was miserable all the time. So, um, so I came home and me and my wife got together. And so when we got together, um, we, we, we had a house and we both had vehicles and she was working and I had money and stuff and everything was good. And then my mom comes over and it was about, it was probably this day, seven years ago, because it's been exactly seven years since that has occurred. It's been one full set of seven. And now everybody's like, hey, we need your testimony. We need you to do this. Hey, you're speaking here. Can you do a 45 minute video? And I've never done any of this before. So uh, he gave me a testimony and now he expects me to give it give it out so that's why we're here but anyways so mother comes over and we're having a housewarming party and uh, she tells me that the lord chastises those that he loves and so i felt like the almighty called me out of pennsylvania back home and i had that understanding so when she said that i was like my response to her was it's coming ain't it mama and she said yeah and we continued to eat, and it was just turned on the front porch, and it was a day just like today. It's almost identical day. It's wild. And so, well, within six weeks, uh, let's see, it says she told me the Lord chastises those he loves, and that that was uh, that. So the next thing that occurred is this red bird came in, and it landed on our front porch. And my mother always talked about the red bird. It's just one I was very familiar with, favorite bird in the world. And so... I seen it and it looked like it was kind of maimed or whatever so I picked it up and I got I'm holding it and I put it in a shoe box you know like you would I come out the next morning and it's dead and I was like well, that's odd so I went and buried it in a little box on the side of that driveway where we lived out there and in six weeks from that point uh, we lost our house Heather and I did uh, my lost my truck she lost her car she lost her job uh, our phones we could no longer pay for them and this is almost i mean it's just one thing right after another and i lost my job because i lost my driver's license so i can't get back up north my mom has two strokes two heart attacks and this is in one day so Jeez. when we lost her house we go to mom's when my sister had came in there from the, you know wherever she was and uh, we got into some altercation and she has me arrested okay things are great so then I get out of jail and I'm homeless right then my dad dies best friend in the world so when my daddy died my mother's in in her situation now she's in the nursing home I got nobody I'm I am up the creek and it's not a fun creek it's not a good creek. It's not a creek you want to go up. <laughs> Anyways, and so then Heather and I separate right after that. And at this point, I was raised up by my dad and my brothers in a manner of understanding. And I went into the world. And then when I looked like they looked and I acted like they acted, and I was having to pay for those sins, right? 
they turned their backs on me. They forsook me. They judged me. They pointed their fingers at me. Who helped create who I was? And uh, I hadn't. Uh, I wouldn't hide my sin like they did. They wanted everybody to see them and know that they were good and all that they were, but they didn't want people to know the real them. I got no filter. What you see is what you get. I'll right. not change it for no man. You know what I mean? That's just what I am. And so because of that, my brothers forsook me. And at this point in my life, I am totally and utterly alone. I have no way to make money. I have no vehicle. I got nothing but a bag of clothes. And so I'm bouncing around from place to place, uh, living with random people, like uh, just the people that I... Because I'm in and out of town so much, I don't know a lot of people. There's no options. Right. So then I just happened to run into someone that I did know. I didn't look them up. I was at Walmart at 1230 at night, and there they were. How does that happen? Why are you at Walmart at 1230? Oh, yeah. I'm homeless. How are you doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? So you you said yesterday that all of this happened in how long? Six weeks. Six weeks. In Inside of six weeks. Wow. So your mom had, what was it? Uh, two strokes. Two strokes, a heart attack. Two heart attacks. Two heart attacks. Yeah, the, all four of them together was one major occurrence. That's God's mercy. Wow. It wasn't four major ones, <clears throat> but it was enough to throw her completely. She's been in the nursing home since then. Wow. And until this past, uh, until this year, until like a month ago, my mother was always in and out of uh, knowing what was going on. And in the last month, she's been my mother again. Wow. We've talked about stuff that we talked about before this happened. So when the seven years was totally completed, even my mother's memory came back. Wow. What? Yeah, I seen that. I can't explain it, but I seen it. So in six weeks? Uh, in you... my 25th, I was 25 years old when this started. Wow. Mm -hmm. So everything went to shambles in that six weeks. Now you're homeless and kind of just, I kind of wanted to get a time frame because you mentioned this yesterday. I'm, I'm 25, so I'll... All this happened within, uh, by the, from now, to, uh, what month is Father's Day in? June. So, yeah. So, uh, it was. Yeah, it was almost exactly seven years ago, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it, it, it was happening right now. We were, we had to be out of the house by the end of this month. Wow. Seven years ago. So, six weeks from then, it was phew, all wow. pot. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to your story. Sorry, I didn't want to, I kind of wanted to get a time frame because you shared that yesterday and it was just like wow it yeah. just it went to heck in a hand basket and he pulled no he, time flat we'll see what happened when my daddy died i had nobody to turn to there's nobody but me nobody nobody and the only person the only thing that was was there was god and so when my dad left who was heavy influential who was the source of my brothers so when dad was gone that avenue of understanding died with him and then so i believe this the almighty took my dad out because he was calling me hmm. you understand yeah so when he took him he introduced himself to me huh and so i feared my daddy's death from the time i had old, but since i was old enough to understand i i would do things as a child and i thought that if i didn't do this my daddy would die i kept a comb like a comb it was blue about this long on top of my entertainment center in my bedroom in the bristles or whatever they are that you comb your hair with pointed out on the ledge and if it wasn't there i was afraid that my daddy would die why don't ask it's just something i did huh and so each night when my daddy would say i'm going to bed i'd tell him i said i love you i'll see you in the morning and when he would say all right i would repeat it until he said okay and sometimes it would be seven or eight times, and he he never understood. He never knew, never told him. Wow. And I was afraid that Dad would be gone if he didn't say this. Where does that come from? I had no clue, but I did that. All I remember is that the fear of losing my dad was instilled in me because I don't know why. But I feared that. So when it happened, I think I shed maybe five tears when he died. It didn't affect me like it did because that was a mercy because even though everything was going wrong, the Almighty comforted me in the death of my father because I had him. Right. I didn't really grasp him as I do today. But from that day till this day, it's been just like growing and growing, so on and so forth. But uh, when, when the old man went, 
And when Heather went and the things that I love the most in life are no longer there, I learned to love him. Right. Because I knew that if I didn't find him, that I would die. I would perish, that I would never get out of this. Don't know how I knew that. But it's just the fact, you know, you don't drink water, you'll thirst to death. If you don't eat, you'll starve to death. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's the very same thing that, that happened then. But um, I was walking down the side of the road that day. I, my brother's... Uh, you know what's crazy? Those phones I told you that were cut off by okay. Verizon. Okay. Okay. They come. I don't. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Well, no, I tell you, right here. It's uh. Oh, did uh, you say that yesterday? No, right now. Uh, it was in this. We lost your phones. We lost your truck. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. All yeah, that yeah. stuff. I still had the phone, but they didn't operate. Right. That phone was reactivated by Verizon for one month. Just out of the blue. Out of the blue. Don't just happen. Okay. So this Long is this enough, is this is about the time. Right as so my you, daddy died. I just right, got out of jail. Okay. I'm homeless. So now this is going back to the the point where you were back in Walmart walking around because you said you ran into a friend. This was just before that. Just before that. Just before that. Yeah. Wow. And so okay. the phone comes on one day and I notice I, I know because it, when you looked at the phone you could tell that there was no service on it because it didn't say 4G. Right. And the 4G was there and I was like, oh my phone works. And I called and I was like, what? Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I found out that my daddy died in a text message i've never been to his grave i i don't even know i didn't know until this year where he was even buried you know wow that's how serious my situation was and so what i did was i searched for he who said follow me he said let the dead bury the dead you come and follow me and that's a very profound statement to me because i lived it Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I found life thereof. And so when I, I focus on him who is, who he who was and is and is to come, you know what I mean? Yeah. The one who has all authority of heaven and earth. The one who, he's who called me. So he gave me grace even then when I was just a miserable, I was an alcoholic. I was many, many things. And, and drugs and alcohol go right together in the crowd that I run. Right. And then, so... uh he took Heather and Braden away from me long enough for me to have the understanding that you can't do that. So you, so you had Braden at the time that you ended up homeless the first uh, time? Yeah, me and Heather were together. Yeah, okay. he, he was two. Okay. Yeah, Heather, Heather had actually had him before we got together. And uh, when I came home from Pennsylvania, uh, I went over to see her at her mother's house, and she had cooked. And uh, I walked through the door, and there's this little kid, this little fat. He's gorgeous, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, he, and he looks up at me, and he does this little thing. He's like, like he's studying me. And he does, he, it's how he cocked his head. You know, it's weird. And he looked at me, and he said, hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. And I was like, look at that. You know, like, whoa. And, you know, his dad ran out on him and Heather and stuff, and I was the closest thing he'd ever had to a daddy. And so one of the last things my old man ever told me, he said, son, he said, you need to take care of that boy. You need to take care of him. And so after after Dad dies and me and Heather separated, the last thing my old man said was take care of him. And I ain't even got him. How do you deal with that? You drink. You drink a lot. You, dr you try to drink yourself to death because at this point you don't care to live. <coughs> and so I drank as hard as I could, uh, just as, absolutely as hard as I could. I didn't, I didn't care. Everything I knew was gone. But God had approached me and I wasn't sad about dad so I knew that happened but I didn't understand it so I, I didn't it was whatever wow and so I end up meeting uh, this girl in Walmart uh, I, I knew this guy in high school it was his ex-girlfriend so we knew each other right and so she's like hey how you doing you did a little little uh, I just moved in this new place you know come over and see me and so I was like well I ain't got nothing better to do so I go over and hang out and uh and that's where I'm at for about six months, is at this girl's house, sleeping in her spare bedroom. And uh, I'm a half a mile from the church that my godparents raised me in, okay? So when me and Heather are homeless, walking down the side of the road, we walk past the end of their driveway, Lillian and Grady. And it's my godparents. I hadn't mentioned them before. And so they're at the end of their driveway. I took my first steps with these people. And I lived in their house every weekend until I was about 17 years old. Wow. And they looked at me, and they wouldn't even speak. 
Whoa. And I'm walking down the side of the road with a woman and a child, and I'm like, okay. I told Heather, I said, God will not leave us on the side of the road. And so we were, we went to a place and stayed for a little while because Buddy owed me a favor. But anyways, I, uh, that happened right before me and Heather split up. That was the last place we lived together. So anyways, long story short, I ended up at this trailer half a mile from the church that I was raised in. Well, the ministry that was there had actually built another church. They were at the far end of the road, which is about three miles past where the church was. And I, uh, I, uh, I was like, Mama used to walk to church, my mother told me. I was like, I'm going to walk to church. So I walked to church, man, it was a Wednesday evening, and I got in there, and just the hymns they were singing, dude, I busted out in tears. I was so convicted. It was the exact same thing that day that happened to me yesterday. The tears, the the thing. It's the only other time I experienced it in my life. So anyways, so I start going to church and stuff, and I'm there about two Sundays, and this lady uh, is sit, standing behind me, and it's altar call. And I, we know who each other is, but we don't know each other. And she reaches up, and she slaps me on the back, and she <laughs> says, Are you going? And I was like, Well, yes, I am. You know, I had never been at the altar like that. So I went down, I actually went to the altar twice that day because I wanted fixed. And so I still drank even then. Uh, and so after that, um, let's see here. Yeah, and so he gave me this scripture. It said, uh, after I'm suffering, <coughs> forsaken by my brothers, and, and they're just absolute, I couldn't believe what they done. You know what I mean? These people taught me who I was. Yeah. And then they forsook me. So I'm like, whatever. And then I see the scripture that says, I will never leave you nor forsake, forsake you. you. And I was like... So that registered, hmm? that registered pretty hard with you. Well, absolutely, because everybody I knew in my life had forsaken me. Even the man that I walked in his house for the first time in my life, I'd ever stepped and made, made a... Ever walked and made a step. <laughs> there we go. Anyways, so I knew that I was in trouble, but I knew that if God said that, I believed it. I had no other hope. I had nothing else to choose, so I chose that. It's funny how his mercy works. He yeah. forces it's like standing in a burning building that ain't got no doors, and you can walk right out. It's either you stay there and burn down, or you get out and live. That's the choice that he gave me, right? And so I operate in that choice. Anyways, so I cried out like no tomorrow, and, I, and that started my faith. And I didn't see Heather and Braden at all for that time, and it's about... Uh, at that point, I'm probably about 10 months in uh, in chastiser, a little longer than that. And so this is about 20 months later. I'm, uh, I run into a guy, and I'm living with him. I met him on a creek bank at the park. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just that's the safest thing. You meet an old guy <laughs> on the side of a creek bank, now you're living with him. <laughs> and so, uh, and I hadn't worked for nothing that whole time. I'm, I'm dependent on other people. Right. He wouldn't even give me the dignity to be able to. He took my dignity with it. He revoked all my privileges. He took every option that I had away from me, and I had to beg or be dependent on what someone else would give me. And you had to eat what they said. You had to endure their smart mouth comments. Right. You had to. You had to endure it. You didn't have a choice. And so uh, that had been 20 months since Heather and I had been uh, separated, or since the whole thing started and then I'm living at Jack's for about three months and I'm reading my Bible and uh and it said uh I wrote this down when he gave me this scripture it's 8 57 Sunday morning January the 26th 2014 and I write beside it it's finally over and it's Zephaniah 3 15 it says the Lord has taken away your judgments he has cast out your enemy the king of Israel even the Lord is in the midst of thee you shall not see evil anymore so i was like it gets out because he's given me scriptures every now and then right the context of the scripture is relevant because he's speaking directly to me right. i don't understand any of the history of israel don't even care oh i know that god is dealing with me i don't even know what israel means so i took that and i'm like it's finally over like this is done that was sunday morning at what nine o'clock in the morning and then seven days from that time heather and i were back together seven seven days so this is the beginning 
of the eighth year of my life and walk with Hashem. And this is uh, the conclusion of seven years. So seven is a very, very valuable number to me. On the seventh day we rest. On seven days from the day that He told me my promise, He gave me my wife back. So very, very, if, if, we, don't, if we don't operate in His system, we just totally miss, you know? And then, uh, let's see, what happened after that? Yeah, Heather and I are back together the following Sunday. I had not seen or heard from her in 23 months. I had deleted wow. every picture I had of them, tore up every letter I had from them. I didn't have, a, didn't have any evidence that we had ever been because I had to completely erase them from my mind. Because you thought it was never going to happen again. And I couldn't endure the thought. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And so at this point, now I have hope. Now my hope begins. Without faith and hope, you got nothing. I hope in Him because now I have experiences with Him. It builds my faith, you see. And so I think that's all that I had written down there, but I had a few scriptures that He had given me along the way. And so uh, the thing is here with chastisement, my mother had told me. And so this is Yeshua talking. He says, and it's in Revelation 3.19. It says, as for me, I rebuke and discipline every one I love. Oof. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And then, uh, and so in, when I was in the midst of that, I said, you know, I want to be serious about this because I wasn't happy before any of this happened. And now things are just hard. I'm still unhappy the same as I was before. And I asked for the king's treatment. I prayed this. And I said, uh, I want the discipline that you would give your own son. And this is God I'm talking about, the one that created everything. And if things don't work in discipline or order, they don't. you can't be a part of what he's doing. Right. And that's all I wanted. So I asked him, I said, give me the discipline that you'd give your own son. And I said, so that he would be uh, acceptable in your inner courts where you are. I'm talking about on where you're at. And I said, I don't care how bad it hurts, how long it takes. That's what I want. And I'll do whatever you show me to do. You know, and so that's what we've done. And then I told Heather when we got back together, uh, I said, I trust God. And I believe that He's doing some things. And I said, we're Abraham and Sarah of our generation. I said, that's who we are. Our families are totally just off the wall, crazy in the world. And I said, things don't work for us in the world anymore. I said, if we don't do this God's way, I said, we'll never make it. And I said, if you love me, you're going to have to follow me this way. I said, or we can't be together. I said, well, you do that. And she, she didn't even hesitate. She said, yes, I will. Because her life was just as bad as mine in the meantime. Hmm. So almost, it's crazy what he put her through. So he had gotten us both ready to be together because before when we got together, we, we couldn't operate and stay together. We would have ended up betraying each other or however people in the world do because you're, you're, not, uh, you're not capable of right. anything that is good. Right. And so when you in, when you experience the, the chastening of the Lord, it changes, I think, your DNA. And so, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, oh, and I'm trying to remember where I went yesterday. Because so, it's just, okay. It's, well, then I'll, then I'll interject real quick. Yeah, do that, please. So, you, you, yesterday, so you got to where you were at. Mm -hmm. Then you explained on where you were at the point in time when you met Tony Boyett. Oh, yeah. So Heather and I are together. We get back together, right? Because that 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 bring, oh, that yeah. bring, that brings you in, that brings you into the part to where you came to Torah. That's right. That's exactly right. So the thing that occurred right after that is me and Heather are back together, and Heather's got this house up, and uh, it's about like four miles from where we live now. And so when her mother finds out we're together, she goes absolutely ballistic, dude. I'm talking about this woman has us evicted. She has our power cut off. She calls and acts like she's Heather. She called the law and told them that Heather was trying to get credit cards in her name. What? Just stirring up trouble because Heather wouldn't do what she wanted her to do anymore, so her mother went nuts. I've never seen anything like it. But what happened was is that the Almighty raised up such a circumstance that it was irreparable. You couldn't go back. So Heather wouldn't. We would never trust you again. We will never have anything to do with you again because he who loves mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. Okay? So that occurred. We're like, Psh. Ain't dealing with that. Following God. Don't care what I got to leave behind. It's happening. This is going to happen for us. Okay. You know what I mean? So that's what we did. We've not spoke to her since seven years ago. Crazy. 
crazy. No, it's not been seven years. It's been five years ago because that was two years after we got back. You know, we started. So, anyways, so we, we look at that house, and so we're sleeping in a Jeep, Liberty, and Braden's, uh, Braden's almost four at this point, and he's sitting in his seat in the back, and he thinks we're camping. So we drive around. So wait, where, where were you sleeping in a Jeep? Were you sleeping in somebody's driveway? We were sleeping they... in a pine thicket in Blue Ridge. So they, they, they came in and they cut all this property down the side of the four lane and deemed it commercial. Nobody ever bought it, so it grew up in a pine thicket. You know what I mean? And it, so you're it, sleeping in a Jeep Blue Ridge in a pine thicket just, with your family? I am. Just just got them back. I think, <laughs> hey, I, I'm stoked I got them back. Right? <laughs> you know, we're facing some hard times. And so uh, I'm sleeping in a Jeep. And I hear this voice say, go to Bud's. I'm like, I'm not going to Bud's. No, what it was Bud's? Was what it? Was Bud's? it? This was a man that I knew since my youth. Okay, so it's not a store. It's it's somebody's house. That yes, you it's, actually... it's, it's this old man that I just, it's like he just popped into my frontal lobe. I was like, oh yeah, Bud. Okay, so go, I, father like, told you to go to Bud's. Yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to Bud's. Because I don't know what I'm listening to because I'm going through a traumatic experience. I'm sleeping in a Jeep and I'm hearing voices. So this is the first time you've heard the Ruach? This is, uh, well, that night it was, you know. The the situation was what it was, was making it. Periodically, I had thought things and now we know that it was the Spirit of God trying to help and direct us. And then now you got bad thoughts that say, go do things you shouldn't do. And you're like, where'd that thought come from? You yeah. know what I mean? So I'm no dealing kidding. with these things. And so I hear that and I'm like, I'm not going to bud. So after three nights of sleeping in that Jeep, uh, wondering what in the world that I was going to do, uh, what do you do? And so uh, we go to Bud's, and I'm like, hey, can we can we stay the night? You know, and he's like, yeah. So his son is like in his mid fifties, and uh, he and his wife get out of the bed in that spare bedroom, and they let us sleep in it. Wow. We just wanted to sleep on the couch, you know, but they gave us the bedroom. So I was like, oh, God, yes, you know. So me and Heather and Braden, we all sleep in bed. And uh, and so I was like, wow, it was like the greatest night's sleep ever, you know. And then we uh, we stayed nine months. We had to stay one night and stayed nine months. <laughs> Jimmy Wayne and his wife moved out the next day. They went to Cleveland, Georgia for whatever reason. They just wanted – it's like this thing happened. When we showed up, everybody went and done other things. Right? So when Jimmy Wayne and them moved back in, a situation rose up and we had to leave. Okay. So he was gone the whole time we were there. We had to run to the house. We didn't have no money. I didn't work a bit, uh, except for about six weeks of that whole time on a crew, a rebuilding a steel building that it had burned. It was a rubber thing down in Savannah, so it burned. And so we went down and redid it. It, it was a it was a big building, 180,000 square feet, I think is what it was. But anyways, um, I'm down there and I still drink. I'm taking every dime we have drinking. I mean, I'm miserable. I got a thirst, son. You couldn't, you couldn't stop it with that pond full of beer, son. I'd have sucked it dry and asked for more. And this is the type of thirst I had, buddy. I'd wake up in the mornings and that's what my focus in the day was. And, and I, but I was going to church looking for God. And so the old man Jank that I was living with, he told me, he said, he said, son, he said, I don't agree with you. And I said, won't you agree with me, Jack? He said, well, son, he says, you drink like you do, like I do. And he said, you, you read that Bible. He said, son, that ain't right. And I told him, I said, buddy, if I don't read this Bible, if I don't pick this up, I'll never put that down. Mm. I said, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the heck out of this. I'm trying not to If there's to any stay quote here. to pull from this interview, yeah. it is that. Right. And so wow. that was the only lifeline I had. I knew I stuck, son, and but I knew that only God could help me. And so I done both until one of them quit. You know what Golly. I mean? And that was uh, God didn't quit. He helped me. That is he, awesome. He saved me from that. You know what I mean? And so uh, I was crazy, man. And so I was still doing all that stuff. I was going to church and stuff, and I... I decided to quit drinking and I wanted to quit smoking and so um, I guess me and Heather had been back together about shoot I don't know six eight months and I was entertaining that thought we're living at Bud's and I was like dang I'm, I don't want to lose my teeth it just come to me one day I'm thinking about it I said Lord I said I know that if a man smokes and uses snuff I said he's gonna lose his teeth that's a plus b equals square you know what I mean that's just the way that it works and I said, 
uh, if, if you'll help me quit smoking. I said, no, I just straight up asked him. I said, Lord, I don't want to smoke anymore because I don't want to lose my teeth. Will you help me? Yeah. I was outside between, there's a little pond about like that, right there in front of that house, and I was about this distance from it. <laughs> and I remember asking him that, and uh, I smoked more that month than I had ever in my life. It tasted as good as, I don't know, something that tastes real good. <laughs> <laughs> like that cake you were talking about earlier. Boy, you talking about it, son. <laughs> yeah, boy. And so, um, anyways, I'm working on a crew of 13. They're all convicts, and okay. I fit in great because I do the same things they do. Right. I drink, I smoke, I cuss. I'm just just terrible. Right. But I'm in pursuit. You know what I mean? You're trying. I'm trying. And uh, I decided right then that I was gonna quit because I wasn't gonna end up like them because he stuck. Because it's funny, the guy that I lived with, Jack, he's 74 years old, been alcoholic all his life, sat there totally alone by himself, and he smoked and he drank. That's what he did for his happiness. So, son, if you want to act like them, I'm going to let you live with them, and you're going to see their outcome. You see? That's what I that's what I was faced with. And so whenever I was uh, on that crew of all these people, I decided, I was like, the guy that owned the company, his name was Nathan. And I was like, Anyways, that's irrelevant, but the thing about it was is I decided to quit then, and in the midst of all that, I stopped. I laid it down. Everybody's smoking in the van. Did you just quit work. cold turkey, or did you kind of wean yourself off of it? Uh, gradually. Okay. It took about, I don't know, from time to start to finish, about 30 days, I guess. But you stopped. But I quit. Okay. You know, it's about a month process, but it, it stopped. I was dead set on it because I wanted to live. I had children, and Biddy had just been born. Okay. Okay, so when she was born, I was like, Psh, you, I'm not going to lead them where I was led. Right. Teach them smoking's okay. Teach them drinking's okay. So this is my motivation to cry out. He gave me something and seeing that I would, I would suffocate it with my lifestyle, you know. And what motivated me the most is when I seen my wife who said she would follow me suffering because of my choices. Mm-hmm. I, I knew that my choices were causing her grief, and she was so good. She was honest. She followed me. When I was the brokest and the lowest and the worst in my life, she never even, she, she, she didn't even, she never went nowhere. She, she could. She could have left, but she didn't. Because God made her for me. And so I decided for real that I was going to follow him. I was going to give him a little bit more in hopes that he'd give me something else, and he did. And so we we leave that place, and we're sitting in our Jeep again, and we're homeless. I know where to go. So I called this cat that I was going to church with, and I told him exactly what happened because there was a situation that had occurred. And uh, I was like, hey, dude. I said, this is what happened, man. I said, I'm sitting down at this park. I said, I ain't got no money, and I ain't got nowhere to go. And so a uh, cat we went to church with, he said, I got somewhere I can stick you. I said, you do? He's like, heck yeah, I do. He said, you know Larry? I said, Seabolt? He said, yeah. Well, he was the chief of police in the town who got in trouble for doing things with his authority that a chief of police ain't allowed to do. Okay. So he was on federal probation. All right. He broke his federal probation, so they put him in police jail. Police prison is what okay. they put him in. It's real prison, but it's more like a... You're in there with judges, and you're in there with lawyers, and you're in there with ex-police because you can't go to main population. Oh, they, Prison, yeah, you, you yeah. know what they do. And so anyways, that's where they sent him. And he was living in a fifth wheel. It was 37 feet long and had a super slide out on it, so it was like a miniature trailer, like okay. a small house, really. Yeah. And it had the power was on, um, the water was on at it, you know, nice food and stuff in it. And so we get there, and I was like... Uh, it's in a gated community. You got to be registered with the community to be able to enter and exit this park. This this place is ten thousand acres. It's a big thing. It's full of wow. houses and camper spots and and all this stuff. And so that's uh, so he takes us in there and he gives us a key. It looks like a credit card. It's a fob. You just run it up and put it to the gate and the gate will open. You go in and out. Okay. Right. We're the only one got a key. Ain't nobody else got a key. Kusawati don't even know we're there. We're incognito. You know. We are unsure. We don't know how. We don't know what. All we know is that we got somewhere to sleep. It's got power. It's got satellite TV. And it's got everything we need in it. Right. So we went and get this man's stuff and go put it in his storage unit that he's already got. 
and that cat had a key to it. You know, Larry's he had Larry's key to his storage building, so we put all Larry's stuff in Larry's storage building. And so he he gives me the key and he sends us back. So we get in there, and I I don't have any money. I'm not working, right? And uh, our insurance is canceled that week. So we drive without insurance to church on Wednesday. We were in church every day. The doors open, son, because we knew that if we didn't find God, we was going to die. And so now we spent the last money to drive our Jeep to church. And we come back, we ain't got no money. Now we have gas. Our spare tire had five plugs in it. The spare, dude. I'm talking about that's, that, that's going to help. Every tire in it had two or three plugs in every tire. I run out of plugs, and I, I started having to put screws in them. If you put a, a screw bigger than your hole, it'll stop it. <laughs> That's a true story. And so uh, then we don't have a cell phone because the time has run out on our cell phone. We, we didn't even have cell phones then. We had uh, we had one phone. Okay. And every now and then, by God's grace, was allowed to have time on it. This was just not one of those times. So we're, we're in this community. We have no gas, no insurance, no vehicle. It's uh, three or four miles to the gate, and from the gate to town, it's a greater distance than that. So you can't walk. So you're road. you're pretty much you're isolated. You're stuck. We on a we we're like uh, we're on like an island, surrounded by water full of sharks. You just can't go nowhere. Right. Okay. So there we are, and and so I'm in there in this time, and I'm like, man, I've got two kids, I've got a wife, and now I'm responsible for the payment on the fifth wheel. Yeah. I'm responsible for the lot rent for the fifth wheel. I'm responsible for the power. I'm responsible for the water. And now I'm responsible for the satellite TV. And every bit of this is in Larry Seabolt's name. Okay? So now I have a... So the pressure's just been set on you. Well, yeah, dude. It, and, it, and it's starting to get hot. <laughs> you know? It's starting to get real hot. And so for like 10 days we were in there and we had no contact with nobody. And I told Heather, I said, honey, I said, here's the deal. I said, if God's real and he's really real, I said, here's the thing. I said, he's fixing to have to show himself. Because if he don't, and this is the reassurance I gave my wife, I said, we're going to starve to death. I said, he ain't going to let that happen. Hmm. It's his move. We fixing to see what we believe is what real or not. I said, you can't do nothing. I said, Heather, it's his move. I said, we're stuck. So I'm in there and I'm freaking out in days. I'm, I have to stay in this end of the camper and there in that end of the camper. And I'm watching TV. I'm in total leisure. Got everything I need. Water, food, TV. You know what I mean? I hadn't seen TV in three years. Right. Satellite. And now I'm flipping through channels. I can watch anything I want. I'm talking about the good channels. And so <laughs> that bothers me. Because okay. I'm watching TV and I'm not supporting my family. I've got these obligations and I can't meet them. And so the first time I ever, I guess ever in my life, I got down on my knees at that bed and I said, God, I said, I don't know what's going on, but I need your help. And I didn't know that he was orchestrating the whole thing. You know, you're in the palm of his hands going, hey, can you help? You know, that's yeah. kind of like really what was going on. And so then uh, I'm laying there watching TV and I hear a door shut outside. And I'm like, hey, it's not the neighbors. Yeah. You know, and I, I go to my door and about the time I opened the door, dude's knocking on it. And it's a guy from my church. And he's like, I lied to the people at the gate. I found you. Do you need a job? And I was like, what? Oh God, yes, I need a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm crying. So uh, he hires me to work with him five days a week. And he's paying me $100 a day to work with him eight hours a day. I was like, what the freak ever? What? <laughs> dude, that's money. You know, that's like that's like two grand a month. Hell, yeah. I can buy a coffee pot, you know? <laughs> so I decided that I was going to start drinking coffee in this trailer, right, for whatever reason. So there's no coffee pot, so we got this can, or this pan, okay. and we put boiling water in it, and so there's coffee filters, and so I fill them up with coffee, and I twist them, and I set them in it. That's how I'm making coffee. I've never made coffee in my life. Why am I making coffee, right? And so, for whatever reason, I'm doing that. So then whenever we make some money, I was like, I want a coffee pot. I think it was like 10 bucks at Walmart, you know what I mean? That was a lot of money for us to spend, but we got one. And so, anyways, I want to I want to back up about six months. Okay. There's two things that I want to expound on. I had, uh, I was sitting in the county jail, 
And I said, all right, you got me. I said, I'm tired of this, of what's going on. And this is January the 1st, 2014. 15. 15. Me and Heather's been back together about a year. I got a baby and all this stuff. And I said, you got me. I used to work in this jail. Now I'm a resident of it for however it takes to get out of here. I said, you got me. I said, if you'll show me your ways, I'll keep them. I said, not the way it's done in the church, not the way it's done by no preacher. But I said, from you, God Almighty, who owns heaven and earth, if you'll show me how you want it done, I'll do it. And that's the only thing I asked for. I didn't ask to get me out of jail. I didn't ask to help me get out of this trouble. I didn't ask for nothing. I asked for him to show me how to serve him. And I knew that everything would go away because that was the ticket. And I just understood that all of a sudden. And so, pow, about five months later, Inside of five months from that from that January, I had bought a Bible, bought an NIV, so I could understand what was being said in the Old <laughs> Testament, right? Right. Because King Jimmy's a little hard to understand. I, I can't do King Jimmy. But I was raised, if it wasn't a, a 1611, it weighed 80 pounds, it wasn't good. You know what I mean? If it wasn't KJV, it weighed 80 pounds, and it was 1611, son. You didn't have a copy of the Scriptures. Well, you've seen where I was in life when I believed that. Right. Okay, so I bought a note. <clears throat> And so I read the story of David. And I was like, heck, I'm like him, my brothers. You know the story of David with his brothers? Do you yeah. have another son? Yeah. That's what God was doing when he's looking for me, I guess. And anyways, um, I read about Samuel, and I was like, I love that guy. I love these stories, you know. And then I read Deuteronomy, and there's promises in Deuteronomy that if you search for me, when you return to me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, I will be found of you. So I was like, wow, that's some serious... There's promises back here. And so I, I read about some of the uh, the prophecies, and I was like, Lord, here's the thing. These things are in here. I don't understand them, and this is your word. It's got to be applicable. What does it matter to me here where I'm at? What, what do I do with this to get to you? And so I asked a few of those questions, and it's the craziest thing ever in the world. Uh, so when I went to work with that guy, right, I get in the van with him, and we drive down Sugar Creek, board town to Sugar Creek in the county we're in and uh, we go across this little bridge and I see these fences and stuff right and I see them two big trees in front of Tony's house and I was like wow that's a neat place I hadn't been somewhere that nice in three four years I wasn't allowed to go anywhere that nice I had to live in a trailer park my daddy was a 27 year Air Force veteran he retired from the post office we didn't live in a trailer park you feel me so when I lived in a trailer park I understood that I had been revoked all privileges you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, if you judge people, you'll be made one of those people. I used to look down at people in trailer parks, look down at people with problems, and then I had to be stuck in their exact situation and dress as they did. So I was humbled. So when I seen that farm, I was like, something's happening now. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it was fifth wheel. Fifth wheel was brand new that we were standing. Anyways, so we're going around there. We pull up, and out walks this cat wearing strings on his hips. And he introduces himself as Tony Boyette. Well, my faith is through the clouds at this point. You know, all I'm talking about what the Lord's done for me, how excited I am. He's given me something. I gave him something. Shoot, we got a pretty, I mean, we got a trading post between us. You know what I mean? Right. Giving, giving, taking, and swapping out and stuff, and I'm learning. <laughs> and so that week, each time Tony would come, I couldn't wait to get to work because Tony would come out and talk to us for about 30 minutes before he left to go to work. And I knew this cat knew way more than anybody that I had fellowshiped with before because the way he carried himself and the scriptures that he spoke was from the Old Testament, right? And I was like, what about that? Nobody does that. And so the things that I had only prayed to God about and asked him in specifics came out of Tony's mouth verbatim, word for word, the same places that I had asked. So I was like, Okay, I'm picking up what you're laying down. This man knows some stuff. I want what he's got. Okay. And he's like, hey, so uh, we do a little service on Saturdays. Would you be interested in coming over? And I was like, Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to get two days in this week. (laughs) Huh? Heck, yeah, I'll come. And so I showed up, and uh, I walked in and um, sat down with him. And I've, mind you, the clothes that I had on, I had wore for like nine months. I didn't have any new clothes. 
Right. So I looked like something shot out of a, a cannon into something nobody wanted to walk through. And so when I get there, I, I do look poorer than dirt floor poor, buddy. But I feel good. I don't care what I look like. I'm searching. I'm going. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then uh, he asked me, he's like, now, back in the six months, Heather's cooking me breakfast. Big old plate of bacon. I'd eat about a pound every morning. And I told her, I said, it'll take God himself telling me I can't eat this. Because I said, I know it says somewhere in that Bible that a man ain't supposed to eat this. But it'll take God himself telling me I can't eat this before I ever put it down. Now, with that in mind, as I walk into Tony's house, Tony's like, he's getting down. He's been real nice, and he's asking questions. He says, so, uh, you eat pork? <laughs> well, there's a lot of pork at my house. You know what I mean? I mean, there's there's a lot of, that's what we're eating because it's cheap. Yeah. And so, uh, he's like, he's like, do you believe the whole Bible is what he said? And I was like, yeah, I think it's all true. I believe it's all God's. He's like, so he flipped it open to Leviticus 11. And he's like, read this. And I'm reading down and it's like, boom. And I'm like, <laughs> now it's in my face. And I'm searching, so don't eat, don't eat pork no more. Right that day, never ate it since. Wow. Yeah. And then he asked me, he's like, hey, dude. He's like, what day do you say the Sabbath is? I said, the Sabbath of the Bible? I said, that's on seventh day. I knew it was. Right. And he said, so why do you worship on the first? And I was like, I said, ain't nobody worships on the, the seventh day, dude. And I said, ain't. He says, we do. And I never went back to Sunday church after that. Hmm. <laughs> One of the hardest transitions I ever made in my life because it didn't feel right. It felt like he's wearing women's clothes or something. <laughs> you know, it, 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 honest to God, that's how you could because you're 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 doing something you shouldn't be. I've right. been to church every day for three years. Right. That the doors was open and now I can't go back because I know God called me here and it hurts and I don't understand it. But this man answered what I only told to you. You feel me? Yeah. So I followed him and he gave me a set of them strings to wear and I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> That was that was probably the hardest thing in my face to do. I'd fight a giant, but wear seat seats, you know. But I've got them now, dog. But, but that was uh that was that's how that happened. And then I uh, that guy fired me that I was working with because I quit going to church. And then I heard that same voice. It says, and I told Arnie this the other day. Uh, it said that I was afraid because I wasn't making money. And I just met Tony, and this guy just fired me, right? And I heard that voice say, uh, go with him to the feast, right? And I'll prosper you in the spring. That's three years ago. Spring's come and gone twice since then. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, no, this is the fourth one, right? And so seven years has completed since I was first chastised, and it's coming up on spring. Okay, I got a really high hope for this spring, right? And so now my story is being shared with people for the ins and outs of what happened, the occurrences and all this little, little ladle of what we were forced into by no choice. Right. And the, on, the choice that God gave me was this, son. You can sit in the building and let it burn down around you and die, or you can get out, walk, and live. That's the choices he gave me. And that's why I'm here today, because I had no choice. There was no choice when it comes to choosing him because when you see perfect and perfection you're going for it you ain't got no choice you're going and you're going to get it because he puts it just close enough that you can feel it but you can't get a hold of it yet you gotta, you gotta learn to behave son you know yeah and so i don't drink now i'm not a, i don't have any bad habits i haven't smoked since i was 27 you know that was two years after i was first chastised i turned 32 last month that's been seven years things work in sevens and so uh, the next time you record me, we'll see what happens after this. Let's do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so for hope and for faith, and if you if you search, and the Scripture says this, that he who is, th it, 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 what's it say? He who thirsts for righteousness will be filled. If you knock, it'll be opened. If you test the word of the Lord, don't test the Lord except for one time in Scripture. He ever said to test Him, and that was when He it says, "Bring your tithes into my storehouse and test me, and see if I'll not pour out a blessing so large that you can't even contain it." So I put that in practice when I was in the church. I'd give, give, give. I didn't have nothing to give. I gave everything I had. I was like that, that little lady that put in two mitts or two pennies, depending on what translation you read, and she gave everything she had. 
And he said she gave more than all them, and that was Messiah himself, so that's what I practiced. I'm giving to you, I'm giving to you. And then he, then he put me with a man named Tony Boyette that gave me, when I met Tony, my vehicle had been in pawn for 14 months. I'd made two payments, and they was, they were pursuing legal action on us. And I told Tony, I was like, I just mentioned it to him. I was like, buddy, I probably ain't going to be able to come see you tomorrow. I ain't going to have a vehicle. He's like, what do you mean? And I told him about it. That dude took me to town and bought me a car and handed me the title. Jeez. I said, what? <coughs> I said, where I come from, people will steal a banana from you. <laughs> I said, this man just bought a car and gave me the title? You know? Yeah. So I put it in my wife's name in case anything happened to me so she wouldn't have to. You know what I mean? Right. Everything I own's in her name. She's my helpmate. You know what I mean? That woman stayed with me when we had nothing. I'm talking about... We had less than nothing. We had ramen noodles seven days a week. That sucks. Period. And that drove us from that way of life into this. And now I come to my, to my man's house today, and I was honored with a steak this big. You know what I mean? You know? And, I mean, that's what's happening now. People feeding me steak, buddy. I ain't eating ramen noodles no more. And, and the reason that that is, and it's not because I'm some big somebody, it's that I found that if you honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the Messiah, Yeshua, son, honor will chase you down and stomp you. You can't get away from it. If you honor Him, if you keep His Sabbath, we don't know how to keep the Sabbath. You know what I mean? I mean, we barely know how to walk upright. And we don't even know if the planet's upside down, round, or flat. That's, wh that's where we're at. Yeah. The only thing that we know is that God came, that the Almighty came down here, and He created all that you see. He gave it to man. He gave it to the devil. Then Yeshua came down here, took it from the devil, paid the price of death for it, he was raised by God, and that when we call on Him, that we have a chance at life, and He gives us all the authority of what's down here again. And we don't even know how to get along long enough to daggum use what the Almighty gave us. So this is this is this is this is what I do. I show up. I have no clue. All I know is that I want to be here because this is where God said to be. And somebody asked me a question, I'm going to tell it to you honest. I ain't going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I know in life, that there's a Sabbath that belongs to God. He created me. He expects me to be there. That's it. I read the Bible, and I put to test what it says because I need to know if this is fact. Because what I was led to all of my life by my family ended in disaster. They, they pointed their fingers at me and, and gave me the finger up. And these are people that I share blood with. And now i got people in South Carolina. i got people... In Georgia, I got people in, well, that's probably on the place. I know a few in Florida anyways, but I got a lot of people that serve the same one that I do, and they love him, and I love them for that. I don't have to let them go. Your family. Your family. Yeah. You you love him. You just bought it at a price, same as I was. Yep. Dog, me and you, the same thing, and we're going to fight. Yep. Whatever we got to fight to overcome together. And we're going to cry together. We're going to work together. We're going to know that we're perfect because He bought us and is making us perfect. You know what I mean? We're going to yeah. die one day, and then when we wake up from whatever happens after that, we're going to see Him. You know what I mean? And you're going to be there, and Arnie's going to be there, and most everybody that's watching this, you're going to be there. Because if you was bought by the one who paid by His blood, you ain't got a choice. You are perfect. You're going to be perfect. You ain't got no choice, brother. You can't run from it. Where are you going to go that His Spirit won't find you? You live in His hands. This is, this is His footstool. Can you imagine what it's like in His house? Huh? No, I can't. No, we can't. We don't have no clue. So the only thing that we can do is be nice to each other, help it when we can, and we don't, we don't lie because we ain't like the one that's the father of lies. We come from the one who is truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's who we are. That's what we are. And our mandate is to help each other, to love one. I don't have to like you, but if you fall down in the mud, I have to help pick you up. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I do like you, so it's a blessing. <laughs> well, I'm that's glad. A, yeah, that, that, boy, I am too, boy. <laughs> well, but, I like you too. Yeah. Bro, I, I don't even know where to go with that. I don't either, man. I mean, it's where just... Where do we go? Continue on with life? Yeah, man, I don't know, buddy. I, I mean, just, I, let me ask you this. So, we kind of wrap this up for everybody watching what <laughs> for watching, every, where are they? <laughs> beyond the beyond no. uh, um for everybody watching um 
What what kind of encouragement? I mean, I know you've already given a plethora of encouragement. Yeah. What would you, what would you f- finish off saying? I would run from the very side of evil. What you know is not good because the, see the thing is is if you do not separate yourself from what separates you from God, you will remain with no hope. If you do not separate yourself what from what separates you from God, you will never ever recover from where you are. You have to choose that. He will not force you. He, I say He forced me and He made me because He rose up a circumstance that made me choose. He made me choose. And so whatever you choose, whatever it is that you choose, is you have to choose. we got free will. He's not going to force you. He don't want a robot. No more than you want a laptop to walk you down the sidewalk. You want somebody who cares for you, somebody who's concerned with you. Read the Psalms. Read what David did. He is in love with God, and I'm in love with God. I am married to God, and I'm married to Heather, and that's my whole world. So uh, what would I say to Hope? I would say that. Yeah. Great way to finish that off. There we go. Well, my friend... Thank you so much for, <laughs> yeah. for finally doing coming, this. finally no, doing no, this. You, no, you, this is like winning Wheel of Fortune <laughs> right here, baby. I mean, this is like Jeopardy and everything. Yeah. Not only, not only did you get the the bubble gum for the interview, you got a nice steak today. Yeah, too. boy. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't hook a man up. Hey, you know how it's like uh, back in the old days, they would count out pieces of silver. Yeah. Right? It, no, dog. <laughs> Today we count out pieces. You, of you count out double bubble double as your uh, bubble. Your, your, your silver. Oh, that's, that's great, so cool. dude! Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you for having for me. So, uh, for sharing your testimony. Oh, um, and it's gluten free. <laughs> yeah, it gets gluten free. <laughs> yeah. Not sugar free though. Yeah, that's well. That's <laughs> a good thing. Did you know paper towels are gluten free? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me! You're killing me! Oh. Yeah, but uh, I, I look forward to telling you what happens in in the next year or in the next little while because I I believe that that uh, so here's the thing is that whatever you're going through wherever you're at that there is hope because I'm proof of that. Um, there was a period of five years of my life where uh, you know there was a time when he when he was really really correcting me, buddy, that I wasn't even allowed to ride in a vehicle, and I mentioned this yesterday. I had to walk everywhere I went. I had to walk to get food. I had to walk back for food. I had to, I had to, I couldn't, I couldn't, I had no right to ride in a vehicle. And so the day that he allowed me to ride in a vehicle, it was like six or eight months that I had never, I had to go everywhere, right? Six, eight months don't sound, excuse me, don't sound like a long time. But dude, when you walking back and forth to town, that's a long time. Yeah. And so you, see, the thing that got me one day was I was walking down the side of the road and I watched this cat. This cat drive by in his little pickup truck, and he's drinking a Coke. And I'm like, get yeah, lucky dog. Hmm. My shame was so great that I couldn't even have a Coca-Cola in a vehicle. Wow. You know what I mean? On a sunny day, just riding down. And instead of beer bottles laying in my floorboard, you know what I wanted to see was candy wrappers, because I knew that that was okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no. no, no. And, and so now that he showed me that your actions equal things weigh your actions think about a wise man considers his ways you know what i mean that's what it says a wise man can watch the foolish and become wiser so if you watch this and you hear be very aware that the smallest decisions that you make had very, very great implications in your life because if your small decisions don't go to him or from him, then your big decisions certainly do not. Hmm. And that that's a very that's what I learned. I learned that that even the smallest detail, if it doesn't come from the Almighty, is not for the Almighty. And he said, Who is not for me is against me. Yeah. He who takes to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. You know what I mean? Yeah. So these things he said are very, very important, and they go right back to the terms and the rules for Israel to live by, and that's the Torah. And I've kept Torah since then, and I've learned that the more that I learn, the less that I know. And that's, you know, because we don't have no clue. We, not not until he no. gets here, and so we want to fight and go on and go back and forth and disagree with one another and then be all upset on the Sabbath, and that's not the way to go because it does not bring honor to him. Who knows? We know nothing. It's all about you, sure. That's right. He knows we don't know squat. 
Yep. So, anyways, there it is. Cool. Dude, again, thank you so much. Thank y'all for watching. Yes. And we hope y'all have a great day. Shalom. Oh, y'all. Oh, y'all. Oh, y'all.